Johnny and welcome to this public worship service at St. John's Presbyterian Church Emily with our resident pastor, Mark, Reverend Martin Duffield, leading worship on this occasion. We are all no doubt well aware of the COVID infection situation in Victoria, and whilst this does not immediately affect us in Queensland, it is a timely reminder of the residual nature of this virus, the restrictions that currently apply to us, and the sanctions that are possible to individuals and corporate bodies for breaches. With the COVID infection restrictions still applying, we are all encouraged to remain vigilant and careful in our hygiene. Uh, particularly, I remind you, be aware of the social distancing requirements between separate households at all times. Hand sanitizer is available at both main entries for use when entering and exiting the church. No ties or offerings will be taken up during worship. Please use containers appropriately marked. And there will not be a formal meet and greet by the preacher at the conclusion of the service. Therefore, final benediction occasion, please be seated. As is our habit, we commend to you those of our church family dealing with various trials. Uh, Alan Clark was unexpectedly, is, is unexpectedly absent today. He experienced discomfort and high temperature in this past week. His doctor hospitalised him yesterday with possible infection. It was expected that he would be on intravenous uh, antibiotics, perhaps for a couple of days. However, following treatment, uh, Alan was discharged in the early hours of this morning with medication to take over the coming two weeks. So we trust that Alan will soon be fully recovered. I take this further opportunity to express our sincere appreciation to Peter Downey for stepping in at very late notice and to assist us this morning. It is pleasing to see that uh, our brother John Tucker is with us uh, this morning in worship. Uh, he was home from hospital as of last Wednesday uh, following uh, his hospitalisation for serious infection. Let us pray that his recovery will be ongoing in the coming days. All our church family members in retirement complexes are commended to your prayerful concern. Again, we would remember uh, our brother Graham Ward uh, in the Arcade Retirement Complex at Eight Mile Plains. You might remember last week I indicated that I'm hoping to get out in this past week are able to do so, it was a very pleasant time with family. So we do praise the Lord for that further encouragement. And as, as is our custom, we commend to you Mrs. Jean Miller and also dear brother Michael Nutter and his family. The Lord's Supper will be celebrated during both worship services today. And all who come in repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ are invited to his table. As previously indicated, the elements of the uh, bread and cup are presented in a self-contained package which those participating should have received on entry to be kept until the appropriate time during worship. On this occasion again, the bread is a wafer type substance and the cup contains a black currant juice. As previously noted, this is temporary measure only and we will be reverting to our standard practice in due course. As those who have experienced uh, the manner in which we celebrate, uh, the bread is enclosed by a clear cover which is exposed by pulling on a tab. The juice in a similar manner is enclosed by a silver cover similarly exposed by lifting a tab, both tabs in the same position. Just by way of further advice, there will be a representation of the eldership at the table this morning as a further reinstatement of the customary habit of our remembrance. If for any reason some do not wish to participate, you are invited to remain that the principle of the remembrance of our Lord's death may call to mind a deep sense of thanksgiving. Just by way of reminder, gluten-free bread is not available on this occasion. A retiring offering is also made available today for your support and aid of the Salvation Army to assist in their ministry of helping those seeking temporal assistance. As always, your support is greatly appreciated. We commend you evening worship, 16pm this evening, with the Reverend John Roth leading worship on that occasion. This Tuesday, that is the 8th of June, our morning Bible study will be held, 10pm here in the church. Next Saturday, Saturday morning, the prayer meeting at 7.15am in the vestry. And next Saturday morning, the session will meet at 9am in the church. So office bearers, please note this change to our regular scheduled meeting dates. The session will meet next Saturday morning and the 
committee of parents will meet on the following Saturday, the 19th of June. That is a change to the bulletin details. Next Sunday services, God willing, will be as usual. That's Sunday the 13th of June. And our own resident pastor, Reverend Martin Duffield, will lead both morning and evening worship. Those of our church family who are on email should have received further correspondence forwarded by a pastor from the Reverend Chris Strong, moderator of the Presbyterian Church of Queensland. This follows the special state assembly meeting held last Saturday, particularly in respect of financial matters impacting our state denomination. Whilst this uh, correspondence cannot detail specific matters, which may take some time to determine, it does seek to advise of the associated complexities to these circumstances. Please be aware, as previous correspondence indicated, the day-to-day -day activities of each congregation should continue as usual until or unless otherwise advised. As further information is made available, the, the, the congregation will be advised. In the meantime, we are encouraged to be prayerful for those who are appointed, for those who are affected, and that all will be done to the honour of our Lord. A copy of this most recent correspondence is available on the shelf at the front door for any who may not have received it otherwise. In response to the Committee of Management's duty of care responsibilities, the Committee has arranged an occasion of safety training, including basic first aid, defibrillator use, and fire extinguisher deployment. This to be undertaken in the church grounds on Saturday the 26th of June, commencing at 9 a.m. This training will be conducted by Mr. Danny Armstrong, who is well qualified within the State Emergency Service environment. Whilst committee of management members and other office bearers should prioritise this opportunity, this event is open for participation to any within our congregational family. Just uh, finally, uh, the Moderator General of the Presbyterian Church of Australia, Dr Peter Barnes, has written to congregations Australia-wide with concerns regarding the principle of freedom of worship, which is under attack both in Australia and overseas. With that in mind, a Religious Freedom Weekend has been set for next weekend, that's Friday the 11th to Sunday the 13th of June. We are encouraged in this coming week, where possible, to impress upon members of Parliament the importance of this issue, and to pray for the Lord's overruling hand with, and with particular emphasis on public prayer next Sunday. So we do commend this coming week to your attention. Just very finally, the Challenge newspaper has been distributed over these last few weeks. Those who wish to take additional copies this morning for specific outreach activities are most welcome to do so. We are now encouraged to engage in personal preparation just prior to the call to worship. Thank you. worship our God in the words of the 116th Psalm traditional call to worship on the occasion of the remembrance of the Lord's death Psalm 116 and verses 12 to 14 What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and I will call upon the name of the Lord I will pay my vows to the Lord now and in the presence of his people. Amen. We're going to respond to his call to worship by singing his praise. Um, it's the 145th Psalm, but it's, O Lord, you are my God. <laughs>
Gospel of Isaiah, which is a great passage which speaks of the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the justifying faith that can come through it. So it's uh, the, um, sorry, we'll come to that in a moment. It's the prayer of adoration and confession. We'll come to the Gospel of Isaiah. Let's pray. Our Almighty God and Great Father in Heaven, today we remember that Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. And we gather joyfully this morning in your holy presence, for we too are on our way to a promised land. We have come to praise you for the Lamb of God, our Lamb of God, who was sacrificed, and by whom we are now sprinkled with his blood for the forgiveness of all our sins. Not only because of him have we passed from death to life, but we have passed out from under judgment and instead into the fellowship with you in Christ. And for all these changes, for all these wonderful blessings and benefits, we are ever humbled and grateful beyond telling. The Lord our God, in your great mercy, we bow before you this morning also whole in our Lord Jesus Christ, perfect in your sight in him, beloved in Christ and safe in Christ because of the death we remember today. How we praise you for him who has saved us and restored us and will one day glorify us in your holy presence. That is, you are not ashamed of us in Christ, so we will not be ashamed of ourselves on that day because of him, because of all he has done for us in making us acceptable and increasingly through the Spirit making us like unto you and your perfect image. But our Holy Father, as we come to the remembrance of the Lord Jesus' death, we must remember also the sins for which he died. And we must confess them and be forgiven them, lest by failing to do so, we trample upon the Son of God, we treat as nothing the blood of the covenant by which we were sanctified, and we insult the Spirit of grace. We are not as those who sin without repentance, but we do sin, and we acknowledge this. We do fail to live by the word of God and fail to access the power of the Spirit of God to so live. We sometimes do not manifest the newness of life that is truly present within because we allow the old corruption that remains to resurface in those awful, unguarded moments of our lives. If we set ourselves to obey in every way, in every minute of the day, we know very quickly would know very quickly that we are not capable of perfection. We acknowledge that some days we are better than others, but all days contain sin. And all days therefore necessitate confession. And we confess that in this too, our God, we too often fail. For we do not always repent. And sometimes even when we do, it can be half-hearted as much as it is half-done. Our prayers are so often filled with concern for ourselves and for others, but none for the injury done to your spirit or your glory. And for this too, on the occasion of the remembrance of his death, we confess and we repent in dust and ashes as we remember the Lord's death until he comes. So I accept our worship this morning, we pray. May our gifts and offerings in, in all their kinds be acceptable to you because of a true faith in Jesus Christ with which you've gifted us. Bless all that is offered to you in the name of Jesus and for the praise of your glory and we ask it in his blessed and beloved name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 13 to chapter 53 verse 12. Verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, 
show his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him, for what hath not been told them they shall see, and what they have not heard they shall consider. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, and for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, for he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see, see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of men, and made intercession for the transgressors. And to God be all the glory. Amen. <laughs>
particular we pray for the church, our wider church, the Presbyterian church, and also we remember those overseas and the great governments of the world. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do give you thanks for our church, for our own denomination, the denomination to which some here do not belong formally, but who are nonetheless part of it by their regular worship and witness and work among us. And we share in the circumstances that have come upon us now, where the good name of the church has been affected very negatively by the financial troubles into which it has fallen. We continue to pray for your mercy above all, that you would minimize the damage done to your good name by the failure of mere men within our um, communion and within the organizations and institutions of our communion, and that you would enable all those involved to be very careful with the information they have so that those who are hostile in the media, and there are many, would not have an ammunition from us to fire at your reputation and your glory. We do pray for each one of us here today that you would help us to speak carefully with those who are outside of the church especially and even those within. But we know how things can be passed on uh, that can lead to such damage. We remember the, the, the three men who are responsible for guiding this process, called technically the letters um, patent officers, the clerk of the assembly, the treasurer of the assembly and the moderator. These men have um, a special responsibility. Uh, they are not only accountable to you and nor accountable to creditors and to the Supreme Court, but we know they are accountable to you. And a very great burden rests upon their shoulders. Decisions have to be taken along with uh, other brethren in the church and the assembly and the commission of assembly and the board of finance. We pray, Lord, for wisdom. Wisdom for these people they should do all wisely and well in the best interests of the church in the days to come. That you would also give wisdom to the assembly and the members of the assembly which must wrestle with the major decisions that come regarding property and finance and the like. And Lord, these are among the most difficult days that our church has ever faced anywhere in our country. Uh, for we, and we, we are in the midst of the storm, we do pray for grace and for wisdom as we deal with it day by day. We pray also with thankfulness for the staff and the residents of the nursing homes that have been handed uh, quietly and efficiently over to new owners uh, and which owners have been pleased to maintain a Christian influence and are keen for that. We thank you for that, that no staff and no residents as far as we know have suffered at all in the process that we have been faithful through the wisdom of uh, our officers, in particular Wayne Knapp, who was CEO for a while of Press Care, who took a large part in that peaceful transition. And we thank you for that, Lord, that there is no blame to be laid upon us and our office bearers through some failure or harm to those people. We continue to pray for wisdom, even for the Supreme Court, and for those who are involved in the receivership and others that you would be pleased to have mercy on us and give them by common grace where they are not Christians and by the grace of the Spirit where they are the wisdom to do the just and the right thing and that you would be pleased uh, to bring eventual resolution of these things. We thank you, our God, also for um, the, uh, the world in which we live in the Western world especially, uh, which is so heavily influenced or has been by Christianity but now is in the midst of the throes of um, one of the more common means of chastisement of nations, which is plague. We think of the nation of India at the moment, and we have heard such traumatic things on Friday night in the uh, Indian Reform Fellowship uh, meeting. Uh, and we are stunned by what we hear, and we are reminded of just how merciful you all were to us, that uh, we lost uh, hundreds of people, but not the thousands that they are losing and perhaps the tens of thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands. So we pray particularly at this time for the church in India, for the brothers in those places, some of whom have had COVID, whose wives have been in hospital, two of whom have lost two sets of parents uh, in, in the process.
process, uh, Lord, we, we cannot comprehend how uh, devastating all of that must be. Sustain the Presbyterian Church and all of your faithful churches in India. Grant common grace to the Indian government, to the medical authorities to manage that situation uh, as it persists. And we are thankful that the news is that it is receding as these waves tend to recede. Father, we commend to you the government of the United States, and although it grieves us the things that, that, gov that this government has done, because it is a radical left government, which was unthinkable in that country even 20 years ago, uh, that you would be pleased, Lord, to give the church grace to continue to witness in the midst of that, that you would restrain this government from further folly and evil, that you would grant mercy to those who are in the Congress and in the Senate uh, to wrestle with the legislation as it comes, that even those in the, in the Democrat side of the aisle uh, would see the, the lack of wisdom or worse in some of the legislation that's coming forward in that country. We pray for mercy especially on the border, the south, where there is a humanitarian catastrophe that opened up immediately the government change. We pray our God also for the governments of mother country and Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, and Lord, the damage that's being done there to that nation economically and uh, the health of its people. We do pray for mercy as they struggle with that for the government and for the opposition, that that people also may be spared more misery uh, in, your, in your mercies. Now, Father, um, we are rem reminded by all of this of your, your wrath against sin. And at this time, as we are also still threatened by this thing, may we as individuals and as households and as churches and denominations search our hearts, search our souls, search our lives, search our entertainment especially. There should be nothing in us that would render us uh, legitimately subject to this kind of misery and suffering, even though we may not avoid it. We pray for the spirit of repentance everywhere in the church and beyond it in the world. And we ask your mercies again in our Lord Jesus' name. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And again to God be all the glory. Well, as we remember the sacrifice of our Saviour for our sins and for our redemption, ultimately, um, let's take a moment to uh, remember His goodness to us as we come eventually to give thanks in prayer for the offering. <laughs>
For so much of our lives we recall little of the price of our redemption. Remember little of the sufferings of our Redeemer. But they are the wounds that heal his wounds. And today, as he commanded, we take the time to remember this one who loved us and gave himself for us and who redeemed us from sin and shame and lifted from us the guilt and the punishment due to us. Without him, we confess we are ruined and we are ruined forever. We will be unhealed and forever unhealable without this wondrous reconciliation to you he has accomplished. We are condemned and an affront to you through all eternity without him. But through him we are accepted as beloved, and all of this we have embraced through the gospel of this one who has so loved us. And so accept these our gifts as sacrifices of love today, as gifts of covenantal faithfulness out of that love, and bless them and the givers as they have come today or through the week. And may your name be heard far and worldwide, wide, and may the healing power of the cross and the gospel Bring the balm of eternal life to many more like us, here and overseas, through them, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's come now to the, to the Word of God. It's quite a change in the order of service, so I hope you be very careful that we don't miss things. Let's come to the message which is under that title in the bulletin sheet, The Wounds That Heal. Um, it's taken from 1st Peter chapter 2, 24-25 but also from uh, Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Now there are many ironies in the revelation of God and it's information about life on earth for us. The Gospels contain several of these ironies like losing your life order to gain it, and how dying leads to living or death leads to life, especially when we consider the cause and the effect of true repentance. The atonement itself provides that irony that life comes through death, or in other words, healing comes through wounding. In coming to the Lord's table today, we are looking at another aspect of the life-giving aspects or effects of the cross or the atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was wounded through the sufferings he endured so that his people, those who are truly reconciled to God through him, can be healed. It is a controversial statement, or at least it has been made so by the claims that some, that the atonement somehow guarantees healing from all illness and disease, and even terminal disease, where faith is exercised, and that is a delusion. Today I'm going to, get to address this whole thing afresh under the heading of the wounds that heal in terms of the wounds that heal it and the healing uh, from those wounds and the means of the healing. So the wounds that heal, why do we speak of wounds and healing? When we remember the Lord's death, why do we remember that death? Why, in fact, does God command that we remember our death? And in fact, why do we have this quote here taken from the prophet, which refers at least on the surface to Christ's pre-crucifixion sufferings? Why do we have this whole description of the spitting and the punching and the mocking and worst of all the scourging as recorded in Gospels. The answer to all these questions is profoundly disturbing and ultimately profoundly personal as well. Christ suffered, we believe, as our substitute. He received in his body and his soul the penalty due to, due to us for our sin, sins against God and man. The prophet Isaiah explicitly foretells this brutal truth in Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, specifically 4b and 5a. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. Let me paraphrase um, um, 4b, I think it is, not 5a. Yet we considered him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted for his own sins. I think the Living 
Bible has an actual translation for verse 4b, for his own sins. And it is perfectly true. Because that sentence, 4b, contrasts with what we have in the other statements around it with respect to the use of the pronouns our and we. So we have in those two, four lines, our griefs, our sorrows, our transgressions, our iniquities, our peace, and we are healed. He was suffering for others' sins and not his own, as verse 4b suggests. Of course, the priest and the supporters saw it all in error. They assumed that he was crucified because of what he had done wrong himself. They had their laundry list of charges, of course, and they were all false, just to justify their own evil intent and conclusion. But the prophet, however, tells them, as of course he told, tells us, sorry, as he told them uh, so long ago, that the Messiah would be suffering as a servant for others and for their sins and their evils and not for his own. And this raises an important question about the grounds for suffering. Either suffering for our own offences or Christ's suffering for our offences. What is so bad about transgression and sin that such a violent response is required? Why the necessity for the wounds and the wounds unto death for mere transgressions, sins, and iniquities? This question is not one of mere idle curiosity, because these wounds revealed are wounds in the most extreme form. In the story of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, we know this. Chief among the words of that parable are those in Luke 16, 24, where the rich man says, I am in agony in this flame. So here we have ongoing wounds of some kind, the details of which we have from the mouth of the great suffering servant himself in the parable, or it's regarded as a story by some. What did this man do in his early life that resulted in the level of distress in his wounds, ongoing wounds, after death? Well, our Lord was teaching the lesson of listening to God's word but also in having compassion toward others, Leviticus 19, 13 and 14. So the wounds of hell, if that's an appropriate way of describing this man's consequences, are clearly very serious, not just for their intensity, intensity but also for their permanency. Abraham's denial of his request for relief was caused by a barrier or a chasm across which no one could pass. Nor could the dead man warn the living from the state of life after death, at least with a couple of exceptions in Samuel and the resurrection and ascended Christ, the same remains true, it's always been true. In answering the question as to the necessity of the seriousness of the wounds of divine punishment for sin, we only have to go back to the warnings about the fall the symbolism of the sacrificial system. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die, said God to Adam. The sacrificial system involves the slain, the death of animals. Sin, as we call it in English, brings the death penalty right from the outset, as I mentioned from Genesis 2.17. In the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. It's plainly affirmed in the fifth chapter of Romans, specifically Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Physical death is a reminder of this awful truth, that we do not die of natural causes, but we die of judicial causes. And the sentence of death is upon us from the moment we are conceived, and from the womb itself we begin to suffer its consequences. As I said, the slaying of every sacrificial animal, as observed by the worshipper who brought it on his behalf, was a stark reminder of the serious wound of death, which points to the seriousness of all sin. 
The wounds of sin's consequences go with us through our lives in the words of the Shorter Catechism and beyond question 19. We are just liable to all miseries in this life, to death itself, and to punishment in hell forever. In answer to the, to the questions why are the wounds so severe, perhaps the answer lies in the examination also of the nature of the Creator and the damage sin does to the creature. The whole reason why we ask and thereby question the fairness of these wounds as consequences of sin is often because we do not understand the holiness of God. And because of this, we then don't understand the offensiveness of sin. When the prophet Isaiah cried in chapter 6, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, it was because, it was because first he saw the glory of God in Christ. Literally. He saw the glory of God in Christ. You can see that in John 12, 41. It was that light of moral purity, of glorious moral purity and perfection that exposed the corruption of the prophet to himself. Till then he had no real concept of the corruption in him and around him. Until that moment when he saw the second person of the Trinity on the throne, the robe of filling the temple. The sin is worse. And more even than our eyes, once we get into the face of the glory and the holiness of God. Is this not true for people who come to see the glory of God in Christ through the scriptures? Peter said when he was confronted with Christ's glory, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. If the Ten Commandments don't reduce our complacency regarding our true state of sin and sinfulness, then the Sermon on the Mount surely does this. The law is the gospel's best friend. It is the handmaiden of the gospel because it reveals the extent of our guilt and the need of our Saviour. And so I say, if you teach the law to anyone, attempts at self-justification become a nightmare because people will be driven by their failure to keep that law, especially in terms of the Sermon on the Mount, to cry out for mercy and for grace in Christ. Once again, it is Jesus Christ who warns us of the height of the demands of the law and the catastrophic implications of law-breaking and the inevitability of the wounds that will follow when he said in Matthew 5.22, anyone who says to someone else, you fool, will be in danger of the fires of hell. And of little sexual fantasies which violate the law governing adultery and sexual sins generally, he said this in 5.29 of Matthew, if your right eye causes you to stumble, then gouge it out, throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. These are the wounds of sinning against the holy God. No, your non-religious neighbours may not grasp that. They may see it as a great overreaction, but that is because they do not know God and His holiness. And therefore they do not understand the seriousness of sin as I hope each one of you does today. Whether it is the death of animals in the sacrificial system or the severity of the ancient law against sins like for example adultery or the statements of our Saviour we have just heard or looking at Calvary itself, you are being warned about the reality of facing God one day in His blazing holiness and the consequences of having offended him without having been reconciled, they will bring wounds like I have just um, described. So now do you understand the wounds of the cross? Sin brings consequences in terms of these wounds to which we are all justly liable, for all of them, and for which Christ himself was so fearfully wounded on Calvary. So the Apostle wrote in our New Testament reading, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, and by his wounds you are now healed. For he says, you have been healed, past tense. So the prophet's words are very accurate in terms of the cross. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, Surely he has borne our griefs, he has carried our sorrows, Yet we considered him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted for his sins. 
but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. Now the wounds that Christ endured, of course, were not merely inflicted upon him bodily to spare us the suffering, suffering but in fact, uh, they had even more benefits than removing the wounds of eternal punishment and other consequences of sin before death. So let's look at, let's go on to look at these blessed consequences as a result of Calvary's cross uh, in terms of the healing of the wounds. We don't often think of the work of sanctification as healing. The application of redemption by the Spirit, however, is truly a healing. I tend to speak of redemption at times as causing peace between God and man, between a man and other men, and a man and himself. That's gender inclusive. Peace or harmony within the relationship of personal beings is one of the first healings that comes from the cross. The pain of human rebellion and its effects are immediately healed. The war with God is over. And all previous negative feelings and attitudes toward God are gone. By Christ's stripes or wounds, we are particularly healed of the misery of the present and the everlasting conflict with God. And of course, out of this comes a flood of blessings in terms of the confidence of faith instead of the sufferings of fear and doubt about life and the world and the future to come. A heart stressed by fear will become healed with calm and with confidence in God. A will that is enslaved to sin and its miserable consequences becomes healed into a will which delights in God's will and embraces and delights in the peace of obedience. A mind that is scarred by evil thoughts and corrupt motions is healed into a mind that is increasingly free to delight in and meditate upon what is good and pure and lovely and of good report, etc. In all these things and others, a person's relationship with him, him or herself is healed and wonderfully so, and it results in a much better state of mental, emotional, and spiritual health. And I'm sure that I trust that you can all testify to that. Relationships with others are also healed through the wounds of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because they're restored into a new humility. The misery of a person who mistreats others are gone when a new concern and a new compassion grips the renewed heart of a newly reconciled saint. There is through all of this the healing of marriages, the healing of parent-child relationships, the healing of community tensions. Yes, the healing of racial tensions. They're all part of the healing power of the wounds of Calvary that work reconciliation between people. Here is the definitive statement of this healing of the breach between ethnic groups in Ephesians 2, 11, 14 to 16. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one. He has broken down the middle wall of separation so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. That is, the enmity between Jew and Gentile there. In these days when the radical left are lying about systemic racism all over the world, and they are lying, we know that the Christian faith has always been the beginning of the end of racism and its conflicts because of reconciling people to God that leads to reconciling people with each other. Through the cross, even national relationships are healed, not just community and one-on-one -on -one relationships as I've spoken. This was literally true of the warring Pacific Island nations after the gospel came through the London Missionary Society and the missionary John Williams to nations like Tonga and Samoa that used to chop each other up with machetes. There are some famous promises in the Old Testament about the Messianic Age. And this one is found on the walls of the United Nations. But I'm not sure how appropriate that location is sometimes. Nonetheless, here is what the Gospel promises regarding peace among nations 
from Micah 4, 3, Isaiah 2, 4, and John 3, 10. It's all the same words. God shall judge between many peoples. He shall rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. The wounds of Calvary have brought the healing of individual relationships, the healing of ethnic conflicts, and the, even the national conflicts, and it is the promise of God made possible through the Christ of cross of Christ, the healing of nations being its greatest work with the greatest of, with the, greatest of the healing of all wounds possible. Well, of course, there is one last healing, and that is the healing of death. The cross of Christ is called the death of death. The late flower and Puritan John Owen has a study, a famous study called The Death of Death and the Death of Christ. The great healing accomplished by the wounds of the cross is a healing through the resurrection of the physical body. The process of dying which we have discussed will ultimately be reversed. Then it will be banished forever in the twinkling of an eye, in the moment of the resurrection. And this is captured in the statement of Paul in Romans 5.17. For if by one man's offence, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of, gift of righteousness will reign in life through one, that is Jesus Christ. So there is a promise also in the revelation about this healing nations in the leaves of the twelve trees in the image of that, uh, that, that uh, the, the, the revelation. It is a picture of the very healing power of the gospel, the center of which is, is the cross and reconciliation through the forgiveness of sins. And so the cross of Jesus Christ and the wounds of our Lord Jesus will go healing on into the future. Now let us conclude briefly this morning before we come to the table about the means of healing which of course is the atonement, our Lord's body on that uh, tree. The text here says the means of healing is by his stripes. So our wounds are healed by his wounds. And here is the irony in the imagery. His wounds, of course, are not just the physical ones, which enable us to comprehend with our eyes, um, in our case by reading and by faith, the sacrifice and the love involved in the atonement, they are only part of the wounds that heal the physical afflictions. The key words which affect the healing of the wounds, the total healing of the wounds of which I have just spoken, are the wounds that are the words that are taken from Psalm 22:1, which in the Aramaic, of course, are Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The greatest of all wounds is to be forsaken by our Creator and to be robbed of all His blessings. The New Testament speaks of this experience for those who suffer this in 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. They, they shall be punished with the everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. The loss of God in Christ, the loss of all comforts and all relief and all rest that is the incurable wound which Christ has healed when he himself was cut off from his father, forsaken, and under that dark, that pitch back black judgment of divine wrath on the on them at the moment of the, or the hours of the cross. As the rich man in the parable was in agony because of the flames, so our Lord Jesus was in agony because of the rejection of God for us. When in the remarkable words of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 5.21 we read, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteous, righteousness of God in him. When by his stripes you are healed, or you were healed, you are no longer forsaken. You are no longer in danger of the loss of all things at the entry of the death. But instead, you enter life and are bound forever to your God who has loved you and called you, not at the point of death, 
but the point of faith. When you know the reality of forgiveness and have the assurance of the sufficiency of Christ's wounds for you, when the Spirit's grace and power begin to free you to obey and to fill you with a sense of the sonship of God, that's when you are conscious of the first, first conscious of being truly healed. For some, this is an extraordinary experience, at least for, for the first time. It is a feeling of being whole, in a, in a way, of being complete, or at least of being at complete rest. True prayer, I would argue, can actually recreate some of that blessed experience of this new wholeness in Christ. Philippians 4, 7 speaks of the peace that passes all understanding. The Hebrew word shalom, which I've told you many times, doesn't just mean peace, it means complete flourishing. It can also be used to describe the experience of the true spiritual healing that comes through faith in Christ, the true resting in his finished redemptive work on Calvary, or the tree, as Peter calls it. And that's a much more glorious healing than simply being healed from a sore back or an elbow or even lameness or whatever that people claim to be able to do as a result of that verse in the prophet. So when you come to the table today, you are remembering his stripes. That though at the time people considered him stricken for his own sins, you know now and have known, I trust, for a long time that he was stricken for yours. And that by his scourgings, his total sufferings and his physical death, you are now healed. You live healed. And yes, you will die healed. I cannot tell you what the full experience of that uh, ultimate healing will be, will be like. But if you have had this experience of forgiveness, of peace, of wholeness and freedom and joy in the Lord, you will have a taste at least of what that will be like and much more in the glorious age that is to come, the moment that you pass from this life. The joy there will be will be as great, if not greater, than that to which Peter refers in 1 Peter 1 9, where he spoke of those believers who rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Full healing will not come in heaven, however. No, it will not. Because in heaven, as glorious as it will be, we are without the physical body. The fullness of the healing that Christ's vicarious sufferings has accomplished will come at the resurrection of the body, when the body and the soul are completely healed and they are reunited and you will stand in your fullness, blameless and with great joy before the living God and the Lamb who saved you. And then the wounds of the cross will have healed all of the wounds of sin in your life and your body and your soul and then forever. So when you sit at the table of the Lord in a few moments, I trust that you will sit as one who is healed, being healed. To be healed in terms of your relationship with God, reconciled with Him and resting relationally in Him. Did you sit as those who are being healed by that same cross, through the wonderful restorative work of the Spirit, in damage and a damaged soul or body, but one which is being restored. You will sit as a man or woman moving toward perfect, full and final healing in the day to come when, according to this gospel, you will be restored and glorified into the fullness of the measure of the glorified Christ who saved you. So you are remembering the wounds that heal you. Give thanks for them as I trust you do every day, and for that which we remember in the supper to come. Let's all pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the triumph of life over death in our Saviour. We thank you for the reality that even though the outer man dies, uh, in spite of the best efforts of our physicians, great skill and the wonder of our medications, yet we know that the great physician is healing us from within so that we get healthier and stronger every day. We thank you for this wonderful truth 
for the wonderful way it's come to us through the gospel and for this blessed privilege to be able to remember it again in this summer. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to prepare for communion by singing the hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. come to the table today as we remember this event about which we have just heard so much, the specific matter of our redemption from sins and all their dreadful consequences, the greatness of the suffering that was endured in order to achieve our forces. We pray with that we should uh, read again the warrant for remembering that night comes from the 11th chapter of the letter to the Corinthians, this perpetual remembrance of the deliverance that we have has been won for us through our Lord Jesus Christ. In what he called in his conversation with the Lord, Moses and Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration is excellent. 
see together the word of the Lord. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, Whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this reason, many are weak, and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Amen. And so with those words we have the institution of this perpetual supper, by which we remember what has been done for us in our redemption through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment now to give thanks for this remembrance in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we have gathered as your people around the table of the Lord, in the same way that our Lord gathered with his disciples on the night of the Passover, which one meal was replaced by another, but which he was the focus of both. We give you thanks for the extraordinary privilege that, we, that is ours to share in this meal, to share in your very holy presence, to remember this extraordinary thing that has been done for us in our Lord Jesus Christ on the tree of Calvary, in his being wounded so that we may be healed. Now we thank you that, how we take it for granted so often, and it is good that we are here again to be reminded of its wonder, its mercy, and the greatness of your love. And so as we consider with our eyes and our hands and our senses the elements, may our minds be taken to the glorious things that they, are, that they point to, that they are designed to point to, in the redemptive work of our Lord Jesus Christ and the glorious benefits that so we thank you in his precious name. Amen. And so on the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. In the same manner, our Lord Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's now take the cup and remember this blood which has been shed.
as for us, especially personally. We thank you again for the greatness of your own mercy and love toward us, and our prayer is that you might enable us to return that, that love and devotion in the days that are to come. And that you might fill our mouths with the good news that there is peace with God, and healing through reconciliation with God, through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this in our Lord Jesus' name. Working in you what is well pleasing in his sight, 